Well, there's another one. Um, you talked about on page 70 and 71, uh, the difference between having a good eye and a bad eye. Sure. Yes. Mm-hmm. Unpack that one a little. What is that? What does it mean to have a good eye and a bad eye? And, and what's the con? What, what's why in Matthew 20? What is a good eye and what is a bad eye? And how does that help us understand what Jesus was talking about? Uh, the parable is of the generous farmer who hires people all day long and he pays the people at the end the same as he is the first. Right. And, uh, and so are, is your, are you angry because my eye is good or it, it, it actually says, is your eye bad? Mm-hmm. Is your ophthalmos ponero's is, is your eye bad because I am good? And, uh, and so you can hear right there that I bad is a way of saying, do you have a stingy eye? Mm. And you do find that in Proverbs also. You find you know, the couple, do not eat the bread of the bad eye because he's calculating all the time about, you know, how to get rid of you or whatever. And so there's various places where you find it. But the place where it comes in most importantly is in uh, Matthew 6. Uh, that was the parable from later on, but it's back in there's this passage where it says the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is, this is the biggest problem for translators, like they didn't know what to use. So I'm looking at the ESV. It says, if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. When the light is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? So to have, so if you know the idiom, you understand he's talking about, if you have a good eye, uh, your whole I guess I'd say way of life will be one of light, you know, but if you are stingy, your whole body will be, meaning your whole life is going to be stingy, I guess I would say, um, self, what I say is self-centered. It, it Honestly, it's a theological statement. Whether you feel chronically like God is not watching over you and you need to, uh, I need save every penny and I can't give anything any because God isn't watching over me. Mm. You don't quite say that, but that's why you can't be generous is because you're so terrified because you don't really believe in God. Mm. <laughs> and so, but if you, once you understand that this is about generosity with money, then when you read that passage, 622, you notice that right before it is, do not lay up yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy. Well, that's about money. Mm-hmm. And then right after it says, do not, no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate one or love, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And so what I find that so cool is that once you understand that idiom, a whole chunk of text becomes one intelligent, interesting, nuanced sermon. Whereas if you don't know that, it just, it's, You've got all sorts of useless uh, interpretation <laughs> that um, doesn't allow you to understand what Jesus is talking about right there. Yeah, they start talking about, uh, you would think like, okay, so what does it mean to have a good eye? What does it mean to have a bad eye? A healthy, unhe- you know, like all these translations, yeah. it starts talking hope. about what is your, uh, it, it lends itself to a yeah. lot of speculation. Sure. Whereas if you recognize the idiom Mm-hmm. Then you're like, oh, he's still talking about being stingy and being miserly versus yeah. being generous. Yeah, right. But it's an idiom. Right. It's an idiom. It's a figure of speech. Yeah, that's. We don't realize that other languages besides ours have figures of speech. Right, and right. So we don't quite catch that. It's, it's. You know, people have written lovely sermons about if you have a good outlook on light, because you're thinking your eye is your outlook or right, your. Right look towards God. You know, people can spiritualize it and come up with something satisfying, but they're still, it might be satisfying, but it wasn't what he's talking about. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, when I talk about idioms in, in teaching the Bible and and especially language stuff, Mm -hmm. well, I, what I try to tell people is listen, Mm -hmm. try translating top 40 song lyrics, like modern pop songs, try translating that into another language. And and what you're going to find is immediately it's going to become very hard. You're going to realize, oh, wait a minute, this is a figure of speech. I don't even think I'm, I don't even think about this, but it's, it's an idiom. And if I translate it literally into another language, they're going to ask me, 
Mm-hmm. Like, like if I, if I, for instance, if I say, oh man, that, that just totally came out of left field. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. we, we know, I mean, that's just an unexpected thing that happened, yeah. but that is a baseball image. Yeah. And if you are translating into a culture that's never heard of baseball mm-hmm. and yeah. doesn't know the significance of something coming out of left field, you know, it's like mm-hmm. you can, they could do all kinds of studies in that language about mm-hmm. fields and the right versus the left. And they could come up with, all, no. and at yeah. the end of the day, you'd be like, like you said, well, right and left. That's yeah, clever, right. but it's not what I was talking about. It's not great. Somebody says, he kicked the bucket. Don't study kicking and buckets. Right. It's not about buckets or <laughs> kicking. There's nothing like that in there. Yeah, exactly. Idioms are, they can be, they can say opaque, mm-hmm. that they can be completely unrelated to the words. So, yeah. So, that's why you need to know the culture. Yes. So, yeah. And, and it's not like you... It's not like you have to know Greek or Hebrew to know the truths of the Bible or, you know, we always want to avoid like language snobbery because unlike like, say, our Muslim friends who believe, you know, anytime you translate the Quran, it's no longer the Quran. Um, We don't believe that about scripture. God's we've never I mean, even before Jesus, scripture was translated into various languages. It's the the message of scripture is what is important. But Mm -hmm. if we don't have access to the languages and the culture and the background, then it severely limits our ability to see the passage in its fullness. Yeah, that's right. And it can easily mislead us. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And it's yeah. not a matter of salvation, though. I mean, it, and it's, oh, no, no. it's just yep. understanding nuance versus missing something that, you know, makes a lot more sense of it. That's right. And if any, what I, when people say, well, which translation is the best? My answer is actually the best translation is not to only use one translation is to have several in front of you, because then you can see how this intelligent team kind of said it, emphasized this part of it. And you see it, um, if you know enough, of, it actually helps. I mean, because every language Every language has these vagueness, mm-hmm. wide semantic range, and your brain is pre-set up to say um, uh, you got to hit. No, you got to run in baseball. You got she got to you got to run in a stocking, or you got to run in after work, mm-hmm. and you automatically go, "Oh yeah." It, it's not like our brains can't do that, but yeah. it's when you have another language that doesn't do it, and you can speak both languages that you can define it, and so. If you know French, you say, just say, I know a fact. But if you say, je connais, that means I know a person. And we use the same word, no, for both facts and persons. But it's when you're speaking French, you can define that. And so it's actually, it's almost useful to have a couple languages so that you can compare languages. And then you're you're showing the limits of the yeah. semantic range and giving nuances and we so that's yeah it can be very helpful to it, have more language. you you said that in uh <clears throat> that was one of the things you said in the book that i absolutely could not agree more with is hmm. have yeah. when if you don't know greek or hebrew yeah pick uh and you gave suggestions it was either in the appendix of this one or was it in reading with it was in My one of these one. Yeah, the Bible. yeah. Exactly. in reading the Bible, which we'll get to in a minute, but you actually give some suggestions in the appendix, and I, I thought they were great suggestions. They're very mm-hmm. similar to, in our course here, Bible for the Rest of Us, we talk, if you can't read Greek or Hebrew, pick a middle-of-the-road translation as your base yeah. translation, and then compare it with one on either end of the spectrum, word-for-word word or thought-for-thought. Yep. Thought. And what you're doing is exactly mm-hmm. what you said. You're getting a, re- You're seeing a range, yeah. and that right. will help clue you in on yeah. the actual, the possibilities of the meaning. We do that here in our study through the Psalms. Uh, I always have at least seven, eight different translations side by side on the screen. So as we're walking through the Hebrew, you're able to point out, oh, that's why the Net Bible set went with this, but the JPS went with this and the right. King James went with this. It mm-hmm. helps you get a fuller understanding. That's right. Yeah. Exactly. Don't 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 wedge yourself, viewers. Don't wedge yourself to one translation, even no matter how much you really, really, really like it. Um, right. Because the people who translated it would probably be the first ones to tell you that's not the only way that the text can be translated. It's just what right. they think makes the most sense. Right. Um, yeah. No Bible tribalism. Yeah.